our very first in a series of three community connect sessions that is specifically focused on the Golden Mile area. We've uh, already led two community connect sessions uh, that touched on and uh, solicited feedback um, in regards to uh, Little Jamaica, which is where we're also going to be working uh, in uh, 2022. So some of you may have also uh, joined uh, the Little Jamaica session or have heard about it, um, but we are running uh, sessions that are that are focusing on each area and diving more into each area uh, specifically. So the Connect is designed to bring artists, arts and cultural organizations, residents and BIAs to a common table in order to share ideas, knowledge, aspirations, encourage collaboration, uh, identify cultural assets and points of vibrancy or, or lack thereof as a way to better animate and nurture neighborhoods as arts and cultural ecosystems. So our connect today is to let you know how to participate in the 2022 cultural hotspot, um, but also to, to really hear more from you about what kind of art projects uh, you can envision in the communities of the Golden Mile area and, and where, right? So like what locations uh, with those art projects um, and cultural happenings uh, take place. Um, so first of all, a bit of a, a background or what is the cultural hotspot? So it was born out of a recommendation in the Creative Capital Gains Report um, in 2011. So it's already been a decade, like 10 years. Uh, and this uh, report was approved by Toronto City Council. And in that report, it said the city and partners should promote a cultural hotspot to highlight a new diverse neighborhood and community outside the city's core each year. Um, and that's what we've been doing since uh, 2014. This is our eighth year uh, for the cultural hotspot. Um, started off in, in Scarborough and, have, uh, and, and in 2021 decided to go with an entirely different approach and be uh, theme-based and connecting with uh, Toronto's Year of Public Art, Artworks, TO. Um, and uh, in 2022, we thought, let's make it even more interesting and fresh and potentially more, ch <laughs> more challenging. And let's change the model and tweak it uh, a little bit more and be more neighborhood focused and be hyper-local. Um, so rather than covering a larger area such as Scarborough or like South Scarborough, Central Scarborough or North Scarborough uh, to really choose like a neighborhood uh, within uh, Scarborough. And we wanted to focus on uh, uh, the Golden Mile area. And I say Golden Mile area as opposed to the Golden Mile. And you'll understand a little bit why, uh, what I mean by that uh, a bit later in the, the presentation. So either way, what I want to stress is that there's been a, an evolution in, in the program and what we're trying to do by being more uh, uh, impactful, by being more targeted and staying within a smaller geographic uh, footprint. And part of that conversation to thank Andrea for, for this, uh, um, for, for that shift was because of COVID and, and uh, the focus on like staying local and hyper local and sometimes not leaving outside of like those domains that that might be a, a time where after, after uh, eight years of uh, covering more ground to shift our, our, our focus and to, to be more impact, impactful on a more uh, micro level. Uh, so what we'll move on to now, uh, we will get into a PowerPoint presentation uh, just on the uh, cultural hotspot. Um, and then after that, we'll hear, we'll have a Q&A and then you can hear from our presenters. So Miranda, if you can queue up the cultural hotspot PowerPoint, that would be amazing. It's getting ready. It's coming onto the screen. And we'll maximize to make it look even more stylish and pretty. Perfect. Uh, that's great. So here we are. This is a, a, a we use this in some of our social uh, push and our poster. It's a, it is a mural, which uh, Laura
Lori hunted down. Thank you, Lori. And uh, took photos of as well. This is what we do. We don't use uh, stock imagery in for cultural hotspot. Um, and it's in the Golden Mile area, a mural that was created by a graffiti artist, well-known graffiti artist uh, named Media. Um, and so this was actually on uh, the Westbury National, which is like an AV company uh, head offices, corporate head offices right in the Golden Mile area. So thank you for the lovely documentation, Lori. Next slide and media for creating that uh, wonderful mural. Um, so the cultural hotspot. Um, so uh, the cultural hotspot is is really here. We want to share uh, with you that we're going to be in uh, uh, the Golden Mile and Little Jamaica area from June to October of next year, and we want to shine a spotlight on all the amazing arts, culture, and community. Uh, that's already happening in these neighborhoods and to be able to amplify it even more with uh, with new uh, projects via via funding partnerships. Uh, next slide. So our goal with the with the cultural hotspot, you can see here are our three things. And this is another uh, uh, mural um, uh, right at YouthLink. Am I correct on that, Lori? Youth Link? Yes. Sorry, I was on mute. Yes. That's a, that's a Youth Link mural also in the Golden Mile area. I do not believe Lori documented this in, in the same <laughs> in the same kind of a, a street team fashion, but it was a photo that uh, they already had. Am I correct on that? Also correct. Also correct, yes. But I would like to say, sorry, Miranda and I have been, Miranda has taken the lead on a lot of these, so I would like to okay. thank Miranda. Okay, thanks so much, Miranda. Really appreciate uh, you sourcing all of uh, the great imagery to highlight what's already happening in uh, the Golden Mile uh, area. Um, so what we really want to do is we want to celebrate. And that's what the photography does and the mural says is we want to celebrate local culture, uh, the heritage, creativity, business, and community in the Golden Mile area with special events, festivals, and art happenings, uh, building community pride. Um, and there will be uh, a, a marketing campaign that celebrates the cultural hotspot in 2022, still figuring out what exactly that looks like, but there will be some form of a marketing push. Um, and we also just want to be able to connect, connect with you through meeting, meetings like these, through follow-up conversations. And we hope that this online format uh, will enable you to make new connections with potential partners. Uh, in the past, we've seen projects develop at our Community Connects, and we've seen partnerships that have continued to flourish uh, even beyond and outside of a cultural hotspot program. Uh, so this is a perfect venue for something like that to happen. So encourage if you find like a connection to be able to share, you know, email contacts, uh, phone numbers, feel free to do that uh, with a chat, either in a larger everybody or a direct message if there's anybody that you want to connect with uh, during today's uh, event. Um, we also want to grow um, and we grow through a series of projects. I mentioned signature projects, which are larger scale arts and cultural projects and spark projects, which are smaller, more grassroots level projects. Uh, we are making an investment in the people and organizations in neighborhoods outside the core. We've also developed a legacy project um, called the Cultural Loops Guide and Tour Program. And many of you uh, may already know of this, but if not, this is a, a great way to, to learn about uh, the, the Cultural Loops Guide. We, we started off in creating like a physical, uh, tangible guide, like a printed uh, guide, um, and then converted that all to a PDF. Uh, look at the chat there, we converted it to a PDF. And just this year after much work, thank you for, to Emma. Uh, she's also on the, the call there. She's on Matt Leaf, she's coming back. She's also part of the hotspot team. Sorry, I should have uh, acknowledged you uh, when I was acknowledging everybody else. So my bad on that. Um, but Emma was a, a great uh, driver in uh, getting everything really kind of geared up 
uh, for uh, where we are now in creating a web app. So you can actually access all of uh, the cultural hotspot tours on a web app. Um, so check that out. You can then see more about not only Scarborough, but North York. Yeah, we can give North York some love. Also over on the West End in Etobicoke. So if you want to explore a bit more, um, uh, a great way to do so. Uh, the other part that we also want to focus on and, and grow is that we have a mandate to provide opportunities for youth employment and mentorship through, through the cultural hotspot program. And uh, that's what the uh, signature and spark projects will allow for. Over to the next slide. Thank you so much, Miranda. So the 2022 cultural hotspot, um, as I mentioned, is going to focus on Golden Mile and Little Jamaica in uh, in York. So these two regions, uh, hotspot regions, are going to be highlighting both historical, present, and future cultural significance and creative contributions to the continued formation of modern day Toronto. Uh, for the Golden Mile, what's key is that. Uh, it's not just the Golden Mile area in terms of like the, the commercial strip, uh, also recognizing that the neighboring uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, nearby, such as Bermondsey, Victoria Village, Wexford, Ion View, Clearly and Clearly Birchmount are, are also part of the, the Golden Mile area um, that we're, uh, we're using for the, the cultural hotspot program. Over to the next slide. Thank you, Miranda. So Spark Projects, it's an opportunity for organizations as well as individual artists via a trustee to partner with the City of Toronto uh, to, uh, to carry out a cultural hotspot community engaged project. And it's primarily for uh, emerging and established local, local arts and community organizations but really it's, it's a key way for you and emerging organizations to be able to, to partner with the city. And in the past, one of the, the big differences that, uh, for, for 2022 is uh, we decided to uh, bump up the, the, the funding up to $7,500. And that $7,500 is specifically uh, gonna be earmarked for youth employment um, and uh, youth mentorship. So in the past, we had a five thousand uh, dollar ceiling for Spark funding. But if you have uh, a youth uh, employment and youth mentorship component also within there, uh, that can be for up to twenty five hundred dollars. So from the five thousand plus the twenty five hundred gets you up to seven thousand five hundred. Rather than trying to like squeeze in for a $5,000 budget, youth employment and youth mentorship, and then kind of that eating away at the $5,000 budget where we kind of wanted to, to make a shift there. So that's a, that's a bigger, bigger uh, change that we have for, for next year. Um, and overall, we're just wanting to celebrate and promote and grow community arts uh, in outside of the core uh, communities through workshops, activities, events, or other public initiatives. So that's really what the Spark projects are about. Over to the next slide. Okay, thanks so much. Um, so as long with the, the main the main pieces that have to be part of the Spark projects is to celebrate arts, culture, and community. Uh, to engage community, uh, they should be free. Uh, should be based in Little Jamaica or the Golden Mile area. Uh, the dates that I mentioned before uh, should be between June and October. Um, there can be flexibility if, uh, if deemed uh, essential for extensions, just as we have had to do over the last two years because of COVID-19. That's uh, what happens when you live in a pandemic. Timelines do shift. So we just uh, recognize that. just wanted to let everybody know that we have flexibility. Uh, any proposal should be feasible and realistic, um, and all projects must comply with Toronto Public Health and provincial safety 
uh, guidelines, but really regulations now, right? So it, they are requirements. Um, and in terms of other pieces, your project uh, should and proposal should bring some additional resources. So what that means is either your organization is, is putting in some funding or you have uh, funding through a different uh, source, be it another like foundation or an arts council, or you even have in-kind resources that you're bringing to the table. So those are all parts of uh, what have to be part of a, a Spark project application. Over to the next slide. So we give uh, priority to uh, emerging local artists. Uh, we want to ensure that we're engaging artists and community from equity deserving communities. As mentioned, providing uh, opportunities for local youth employment and mentorship. And then we also just want to really support local community arts initiatives currently active in the area. So that encap encapsulates a bit about Spark. And uh, now we'll talk a little bit more about signature projects. Over to the next slide. Thank you very much. So as mentioned, these are our larger uh, scale projects, and they are also then uh, meant for more established and seasoned organizations that have already successfully delivered mid to large sized community-based arts and cultural projects. Uh, similar to Spark, um, the, the projects should be free to participants and the public. Um, and also similar to Spark, uh, they, they should provide new opportunities to engage residents in the arts through workshops, activities, events, and other initiatives. Uh, the a, a difference is that it's mandatory in uh, signature projects if you anybody's applying for there to be a youth employment and or mentorship uh, piece. Uh, for, for Spark, it's not mandatory, right? That's optional. Um, in terms of funding, we allocate up to $20,000 of uh, signature funding per project. There is an allowance um, for an additional up to $2,000 for any accessibility uh, related funds. Um, so just uh, be take note of that as well too. Over to the next slide. So the proposal process looks uh, something like this. Um, after uh, today's session, we're going like in the next two, two more weeks and in two, two weeks are actually having our very first uh, cultural hotspot uh, funding info session. That's on November 23rd. So you can attend one of those sessions to, to learn more about the application process. And then after you've done that, uh, you're also welcome to connect with uh, uh, a member of the hotspot team, either myself or Andrea, just to get some feedback if you wanna share your project idea before jumping into completing uh, an online application, just to say, hey, what do you think about this? Like, um, who do you think would be a good partner? Uh, how could you tweak this? So happy to have that conversation in advance. Um, and then after that, uh, we'll review, you can also review your project application and budget with a hotspot team member. Um, and then the, the deadline for all proposals uh, is on February 1st. Uh, so you have the options, one, the application will be one uh, online application where you have the option to choose which uh, project you wanna uh, apply for, be it Signature or Spark. Um, and then after, you've submitted a proposal, uh, there will be a project assessment, and then we are aiming to get back to all applicants um, with an update on uh, status uh, by the end of February. Seems like a long time out, but we all know it's gonna come faster than we realize. So that's a, a bit of a share on the proposal process. Um, over to the next slide. So there's there for more information. Uh, you can reach out to either myself or to Andrea. And we have another slide here if you're thinking about how to, over to the next slide. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Kind of know what's coming, <laughs> know what's coming ahead. If you're thinking about reaching out to other organizations to for funding, here are four uh, potential organizations that you 
uh, might be able to to reach out to and just investigate what other funding options are available. And I believe that comes to the end of our presentation. Beautiful. Okay, another uh, plug here for uh, a photo that is a real life uh, photo from Wexford Park, the hydro corridor in the Golden Mile area. I believe we got this uh, courtesy of the, the Medaway project. Am I correct on that, Lori? Yes, correct. Thank you very much to the Medaway project uh, team um, on that. Uh, so uh, happy to uh, take any uh, questions from, from anybody uh, now, be that uh, uh, vocally or in, uh, in uh, the chat or via email with culturalhotspot at toronto.ca. So I'll just kind of zip it on my end on my end and if there's anybody who wants to ask a question feel free and we'll monitor the chat any takers if not that's totally cool because by that by that standard and that way we can pass the floor over to uh derek and to kyle any takers going once, going twice? Oh, going three times. Okay, Kyle, nice. You're 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 helping me along in the process. I appreciate. Oh, no. no, no, I appreciate that. Like I welcome it. That's all good. Happy to be able to roll that way. All right. So if, if there are any other questions or anything else comes up, uh, feel free to put it into the chat or to email us at culturalhotspot at Toronto. Ca. Drum roll, please. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters today. Uh, really excited and grateful that they're able to join us um, and share information about both a pa their past uh, cultural hotspot signature project, but as well as a, a current one. And we've we've got gotten a bit more off the board from from our past. Uh, uh, presenters. So we, we have uh, Derek Spooner. So allow me to Der introduce Derek and Scarborough Arts, the Scarborough Arts team. So Derek Spooner, um, MA, is a nonprofit. I'm reading your bio here. I've taken it from the Scarborough Arts website. I hope you're okay with that, Derek. Uh, Derek. That's okay. Yeah, all good. <laughs> is a nonprofit management and fundraising professional with a strong background in program and fund development, operational design data analysis, communications, marketing, and team motivation. After working for Stevenson Children's Camp and Western University, Derek went on to build dynamic and profitable fundraising teams at Arts Marketing Services, Inc. and Free the Children in Toronto. His portfolio includes 9.4 uh, million in fuel uh, fulfilled gifts between 2011 to 2016, for the Toronto International Film Festival, Save the Children Canada, uh, the New England Aquarium, uh, the Boston Museum of Science. Derek, you've been in so many places. Impressive. The Chicago Memorial Children's Hospital and Mervish Theatre Productions. Uh, there will be opportunity to ask questions uh, after as well too, so just note that. And Kyle, who's fresh from uh, uh, a trip to San Francisco, I understand. I'm hearing like all these people like either like coming back or like going to Cali. And I haven't been on a flight on a plane for uh, almost two years, which is the longest stretch uh, in quite some time. Um, and there's definitely some like, oh, I wish. Thank you for joining us, Kyle. Hopefully you're not too uh, jet lagged from your travels. Uh, Kyle is, is it Jaron Cio? Am I pronouncing it correctly, Cio. Kyle? Yeah, Cio. Kyle Jaron Cio. He uh, is the social media coordinator uh, at Scarborough Arts. And Kyle is a multimedia creative that uses storytelling and visual design to elevate digital communities. Uh, with a degree in media production from Ryerson University. He is an avid 
image maker and podcaster propelled by the power of inclusive and intersectional narratives. Prior to joining Scarborough Arts, he has worked with the Ryerson Leadership Lab, Ryerson University Student Life, and Inside Out Queer Film Festival. He also co-hosts the podcast In Flux, a conversational deep dive into representations of Asian and queer life. Find him online at Fragile Kyle or IRL. What is IRL? Tell me. I, I feel like you should guess. Though. In real life? Yeah, you got it. You got it, it Nepal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm dating myself here. Like, honestly, it's like, what does that mean? In real life? Okay, in real life, in a park, sipping on something iced. Sipping on something iced. But what about in winter? What do you do in winter, Kyle? Um, we've got a French press going right now. And I'm not <laughs> there we go. So we know that the park in sipping on something iced is seasonal. The seasonal, seasonal activity. Um, Kyle, but well, don't forget to drop your link to the podcast into our chat, by the way. Sorry, go back to yeah. the welcome to fall. I didn't mean to interject oh, and cut that's you off. Awesome. But that's, uh, that's our intro to our presenters for today. So I'm going to pass uh, it over to... Uh, uh, Miranda to queue up their presentation and then Derek and Kyle are going to take over and I'm going to mute. Are we ready? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, I just wanted to start by saying, once again, my name is Derek Spooner. I just wanted to thank uh, Nafal, uh, Andrea, and the whole city team for inviting us to be here and to be able to present today. Um, and I just want to make sure everyone can see the screen. Okay. Is everyone good for seeing the screen? Okay. So um, I'm, I'm going to try to keep this brief, but, but uh, we also really wanted to take an opportunity to talk about uh, Scarborough Arts' involvement with Cultural Hotspot and um, its tenets of celebrating, uh, connecting, and growing with the local community. Um, and we've been really fortunate that since um, I, I began at Scarborough Arts in 2018, we've, we've really participated in this project um, almost every year, which is exciting. Um, and uh, I will start by going, we're going to go through a couple projects that we've worked on, talk about some of the nuances for people that are planning a project. So some of the things you might want to think about when you're doing a public art installation. And then also we're going to talk a little bit about um, how our partnership with the city and cultural hotspot has enabled us to really enhance uh, the projects that we're currently doing for Artworks TO and the Year of Public Art. So uh, before we get started, I'll just uh, highlight some of these photos. So this image is currently of the Scarborough sign, which uh, was our initial project uh, that we had applied for to signature the signature partner uh, project through Cultural Hotspot in 2018. Um, and so this, this is its most current iteration. It's currently installed at the Scarborough Town Center, but it will unfortunately be moving this Thursday because they're going to be doing some construction there. So if you do want to see it, um, I encourage you to go there today or tomorrow. Uh, and then also uh, it will be moving to the Scarborough Food Security Initiative between now and next spring. Uh, and then next spring, it will be going back to Scarborough Town Center and it will be animated by a program involving youth from the seventh generation image makers program. Uh, and so it's it's been a very active uh, place making activity. And then this is a photo uh, of our tour participants at our Discover Aging Court tour, which uh, happened this uh, past October uh, and was operated by, uh, the, by Scarborough Arts in partnership with the Tamil Archive Project, uh, Howard Tam and Eat More Scarborough, who is Scarborough's uh, food critic. And I highly recommend checking out Eat More Scarborough on Twitter or Facebook. And then also um, Daniel Rothstein, the ur urban geographer, who has also created maps for our projects. And these photos are courtesy of Kyle Durencio. So I just want to start uh, in talking about our first cultural hotspot project. So our the chair. So before I joined Scarborough Arts, uh, the prior ED had created a uh, pilot project, which was essentially like a placemaking sign for Scarborough that was the it was like a Hollywood sign for Scarborough and it was installed during the Scarborough Worldwide Film Festival at the uh, UTSC campus and our at the time our, our past chair Julie Witt was like you know can we make this a more permanent project or a pilot project that, that we could then really align with 
Scarborough and like how Scarborough is. And after a lot of talking and discussion, we really realized, you know, Scarborough doesn't have one center of activity. It's, as we said before, it is a, it is a like, it is an extremely diverse community with extremely diverse uh, cultures and populations. And so what we wanted to do was create a, an art installation project that could be a placemaker, could be animated by different artists and be installed in different areas. And so thus the mobile Scarborough sign uh, was created. Um, we were fortunate enough uh, with uh, support from the city of Toronto uh, and the signature partnership program uh, to be able to build the sign. We worked with um, Victor Wong, who is an emerging designer. Uh, Dr. Marla Haledi, who is uh, a, uh, an associate professor and has also done a lot of public art installations and she works at UTSC. Uh, Greg McWood of uh, McWood Studios, who is a really awesome designer here in town. One of the people that is not uh, copied here is actually also Merkwood Engineering because the sign had to be engineered and approved for public installation. So there's specific aspects of it that um, needed to go through an approval process. And then we also worked with the Department of Arts, Culture and Media at UTSC uh, to put the sign together, actually do the cutouts and everything. And so that is really how, as a community arts organization, we worked with partners to bring the project to fruition. And yeah, so here's just some images of the sign. Uh, uh, from its different installations here. This was the original installation that we had done at UTSC. And these images on the sign right now are actually from Adam Zevo's Love is Love is Love uh, campaign project. So they're all um, LGBTQ representations of love. And so that's uh, uh, on there. Uh, this is a, an iteration, the bottom that was done by Media, who also did the uh, image that Nafal had pointed out that Lori had uh, gone and uh, taken the picture of at, I'm sorry, I forget what business it was in Scarborough. Um, is it a design firm? Which one was it? Sorry, Nafal. It's uh, Westbury, the, the AV company. Westbury. Okay, yes. Yeah. So Westbury where, yeah, his work is there. And then we have just a couple other iterations. This is at uh, Guild Park and Gardens. And then this one I think is at uh, the, um, this was right before it was painted. And I believe that this is at, uh, what is the building called? Uh, the Scarborough Civic Center. Um, so I'm gonna go into a few other details of, oh, whoa, skipped ahead, hang on. What happened? Sorry, I've got, my computer is going kind of slow. Where are we? Here we go. So I just wanted to go over like some of the technical aspects people might be, curious about the sign, but also to kind of understand if you're thinking about creating a, a large scale public art installation, what are some of the things to consider in that process? So the sign itself is hu it's huge because it is 11 letters. And so basically we had to consider, you know, what was the size, how would it work? Um, and so basically the base boxes are two feet by two feet. Uh, the letters are, are four feet high. Um, the base boxes are made out of MDO and plywood, which is just a, like it's a general form of plywood. And we went with that. So basically it's not winterized, but it does mean that it can be outside during summer months and won't get too warped or anything like that. And then Creezone is the uh, material that was used to create the letters themselves. And so basically the Creezone is a, the same material that they use to build billboards. So its purpose is to be like constantly have stuff on it, take it off and be very durable. Um, and so ultimately the total height of the letters are actually six feet and it's a, a fully, uh, you, basically people can come and they can sit on it, they can take pictures, they can engage with it. So it's a very functional uh, sign. Um, depending on the space, the sign runs approximately 36 feet in length all the way across. Um, we do require and conduct regular maintenance on the sign. So wherever it's installed, we tend to go by every 48 hours just to check to see if there's any uh, graffiti or anything like any vandalism that just needs to be um, adjusted. And then we also were like, how can we creatively get around the need to stake something so that it won't fall over as a public art installation. So what we were able to do is in the base boxes, the backs actually unscrew and we put in a minimum of 60 pounds of sandbags to stabilize it at any location. So it's really helped us, especially when we install on city property, um, avoid complications with permit 
uh, like obtaining a permit. So that's something that's really uh, important to think about, especially when you're doing uh, an installation either on private property or city property particularly, because there's usually a lot of aspects to the permitting process that's involved. Um, and then um, we also, another really interesting part of this is that the base brackets, which you can't see right now, but basically are at the very bottom of each letter uh, right here. Basically, they're uh, basically a bracket. The, the letter fits in and then they're on what's called like a swing bracket so that basically the letters go like that. You don't really notice it, but basically that helps with uh, dealing with things like wind bearing load or like extreme rain or weather. Um, so just kind of little pieces like that that we had to think about as we uh, designed this project. Um, so why does this keep going to this the 12th sorry everybody I don't know why this keeps going to the 12th uh slide I don't know why Hang on one second sorry technical difficulties okay Derek I gave the disclaimer at the top so this you're covered you're covered we got you covered everybody Thank understand. You. I don't know what's up with I have a really old computer also that's another <laughs> issue let me just go back again sorry um so yeah so we just want to talk about like what was the scope of the sorry why is this not working sorry the scope of of our engagement in 2019 and again because this was sort of like before covid uh the real actual numbers that we had before we had to stay inside for a year and a half. So um, just kind of looking at this, you can sort of see where the sign has been uh, installed and what it's been animating in 2009. So for example, we had uh, an engagement of approximately 10,000 people at Taste of Lawrence, uh, which happened in July of 2019. We were lucky enough to uh, do an installation at Fool's Paradise, uh, which is Doris McCarthy's uh, house, which overlooks the bluffs, which was absolutely incredible. And I have some photos to share from that. Um, we've been all over Scarborough, including places like Aging Court Mall, uh, the University of Toronto Scarborough, uh, Scarborough Civic Center and Scarborough Civic Center Library and Guild Park and Gardens. Um, and we've had plenty of media engagement for the sign. So a lot of folks, uh, these folks actually came and uh, were taking pictures. The, 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 this family actually uh, was on the front of our annual report last year. Um, but we managed to do a couple photo contests with the sign, which really drove media engagement. So something I would definitely, as you're probably thinking about your project, not understate is the uh, ability to do kinds of like, you know, campaigns or contests on me on social media to try to drive engagement. And we've definitely found that that's been something that has um, enhanced engagement with the sign and just generally with the cultural hotspot activities across Scarborough. Um, and then I just wanted to show you some slides. So this is media. This is media or, or Yvonne Blake. Uh, and uh, he uh, was, we were fortunate enough to work with him during the inaugural uh, Nuit Blanche in Scarborough in 2018. And he painted the sign and we got uh, really great uh, feedback from that. And people loved watching him work as well. Um, so that was really exciting. And the purpose of the sign as well is to engage artists all across Scarborough. And so that's really what we've done. And so these are some photos. This photo, these two photos are actually from Fool's Paradise. So you can see how beautiful uh, it is. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to Peppercorn Imagine, Alan Pang and Jeff Zhao, who worked with us and did all our uh, photography and videography for the project. Um, but it really does, uh, as you can see, act as a placemaker for, for people all across uh, Scarborough and uh, is a really fun project. Um, and this year, we were extremely fortunate to work with uh, Kersha Wright, uh, who programmed the sign, and her iteration of it is called Out for a Stroll. And I'm just going to take a moment to show you a quick video of Kersha uh, talking about the Scarborough sign. So... Let me know if you can hear the computer audio, too. Can you hear it? There's no audio. Oh, there's no audio? No, sorry, Derek. Oh, damn, okay. Can you see the captions? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Darn it. Okay. So I'll just play the rest with the captions. So. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for, for humoring that. It's a great, oops, sorry. It's a great video that was created also by Kyle Gerencio. So I just wanna give a shout out to Kyle again as well. Um, and I'll go back into the presentation. Okay. So yeah, so uh, basically I just wanted to recommend that you check out the work of Kersha Wright. Uh, so Kirsch's uh, project out for a stroll is on the sign. And again, go down to Scarborough Town Center to check it out. Um, and we also were privileged enough this year to work with uh, Tony Geberhewitt on the Intersections project. And uh, I'd like to give Kyle an opportunity to talk about his experience on the project as well. Um, but basically, Tony's concept for this project was an atypical photography project that acts as a platform for participants to delve deeply into self-reflective personal investigation. And it helped uh, participants embrace and enhance their connection to, the, to Scarborough and to their own photography practice. So um, I encourage you to check out Tony's website at the bottom here. I think because of technical issues, I'm not gonna click into it, but I wanted to show you the artists, but I'll pass it over to Kyle to talk about as a participant, how he experienced this project. Hi everyone, I wasn't ready to, to chat. Oh, all of a sudden I was so comfortable on mute and being in the chat box, but hi folks, I'm Kyle. My pronouns are he, him. I work with Scarborough Arts as a social media marketing assistant. Um, and I just do a lot of making. And so I kind of stumbled on this project because I was actually looking at a number of different cultural hotspot opportunities um, in relationship to Scarborough and photography. And so this is one of them. Intersections was one of them. The other one was Scarborough Made with Sid Maydew. And so with this one in particular, I was curious as to how to develop my sort of artistic sense um, of image making and like looking at like uh, and curating images while also kind of coming with intentions around like well what can I bring what kind of narratives do I hold within myself and uh, what kind of emotions can I portray um, within within my photos and so those were the kinds of ideas that I was thinking about and so I took this program and I think I was immediately confused uh, because it was just this person who was like okay so like let's set up chairs in a circle and um, there's food in the center why don't you grab some and I was like okay, well, cool, I brought my camera, I, I um, like charged the battery, I did all these different things, why are we, you know, grabbing wings? <laughs> and, um, you know, there was this sort of idea throughout the whole process of this, of, 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 of meeting eight times during the summertime, of sharing a meal together, having conversations, and then moving around um, the Scarborough Arts grounds, outside into the greenery, um, testing out different shots, taking walks to um, the Doris MacArthur space and the bluffs. And I think like it was around the second or third time that I got it because I learned that facilitatively, Tony wasn't interested in creating a curriculum that was geared off of everybody learning the same thing. He was interested in how do I hold space for young people to learn more about themselves and how it connects to the kinds of images that they like to create. Um, and I think that's a really interesting thing because I thought that I'd go in and, you know, would get like typical things like crits or we'd have times where we, we, we shared feedback around the kinds of images that we we're making, but it was more centered around like, what kind of food did you grow up with? What kinds of stories of self can you bring to the table? And if you're thinking about images, how does that come through? Um, and so, yeah, I think it was a little frustrating sometimes, you know, because that word intersections too can, I think, like oftentimes, like seem like a check mark. When we talk about intersectionality, oftentimes 
it's like, okay, so now I bring my, you know, in my personal instance, my Asianness and my queerness, and I extrapolate those pieces of myself in order to create art. And so I think that was the line that Tony was starting to go with at the very beginning. And I said, no, I don't, I don't think that I, I want to look at myself through these boxes. And he said, well, then what are other intersections that you can look towards? If you're not thinking about yourself as an Asian person or a queer person or as a man, and the way that I see, like I, I came to this project and have you thought about your own personal intersection? What's the neighborhood that you grew up in like? What did it feel like? What kinds of feelings do you have moving through space? And so that's why I really think that that was the power in that program. Because for a lot of folks thinking about the idea of intersectionality was very like personal, intrinsic. And, you know, for some other folks, it might be those like, you know, the Kimberly Crenshaw definition that we all know to come in love, where it's like finally realizing that, you know, I am at this level and at this level. But for me, it was very much like, how do I explore different emotions and how do I, you know, come to honor Scarborough in my photos? And so the photos that I ended up with were largely around like having to move from like, I live in Markham and Lawrence, which is by the Golden Mile, having to take the, the, the transit system all the way to downtown to be around, you know, friends from university or other queer people. And, you know, having this feeling of wanting to be myself on a Saturday night, all glammed up or whatever I want, but also wanting to be hidden. And so those two competing ideas. And I couldn't stop myself from like thinking about like, it meant for me to take this program in the middle of the summer and having that to dwell on. And so the images that I came up with were just around that, that feeling of wanting to be seen, wanting to be present, wanting to be alive, but also that idea of safety on transit systems, that idea of covering up, that idea of not wanting to be seen. And, you know, this, this whole project is two parts. Um, we did that summer program and now the part two is coming up at Kennedy and Scarborough Town Center. We were able to actually see the images, which is really incredible these stories around the place that we grew up in um, now being delivered as public art in the place we grew up in and still live in. Um, but for a moment, I'll just share some of the photos that I took on an iPhone. Um, this isn't on an iPhone, but like, you know, it's on an iPhone. I'm not gonna share my screen, that's too hard. But yeah. And so those are the things that I left with. I didn't take, you know, like what's the best aperture? I took, how do you, hold a space? How do you not create a space? How do you hold a space and meet people where they're at? Um, how do you bring in voice into the art that you make? Um, and how do friendship and community um, feed through the process of becoming the artists that we are and the people that we are? So thanks. Thank you so much, Kyle. I think that that really gives a, a strong insight into the type of program that a Cultural Hotspot can support. And I also just wanted to uh, indicate that uh, I think someone had asked the question earlier about like when an organization is not uh, a charity or a nonprofit, how do they participate in this program? So we've actually also worked with uh, the city of Toronto to act as an intermediary for specific projects. And this project with Tony was actually one such project. And so really what we do is we choose projects that very much align with uh, the mission and vision of Scarborough Arts and, and helping to further that. Uh, and then also trying to increase capacity within the local communities. So, so thank you very much, Kyle, for sharing your work and uh, your experience um, so deeply with us. I also wanted to just quickly uh, give an overview of what Scarborough Arts has been doing with our Artworks TO project, which is also a concurrent joint lasso uh, signature partnership this year with the Cultural Hotspot. So part of what we're doing as part of Artworks TO is we've created a joint lasso website called Local Discoveries uh, TO. Uh, and basically what that does is it has a series of each of the lasso's catchment areas outside the downtown core and all of our public art uh, community and walking tours, as well as other art projects that we're doing outside the downtown core. So our hope is that we can really elevate use this funding to elevate the value of, of bringing artistic programming and highlighting current artistic programming outside of the city's downtown core as part of uh, not only our mission, but just trying to really help people understand that there's more to art than what is downtown. And so uh, in Toronto. 
Uh, and so we were really fortunate for the Artworks TO uh, and Cultural Hotspot Project to also work with uh, Tamil Archive Project. I put their website just at the bottom down here. I strongly recommend checking them out. And again, Howard Tam and Daniel Rothstein, who have, are, are in the process of developing. This was our first tour, and we have four additional tours that are going to be launched between now and the end of the year of public art in 2022. Um, but this pilot the, for the Agent Court went exceedingly well. Um, it was actually done in two parts because as you can imagine, Agent Court is a huge area and we didn't want to have like a four hour walking tour. So we split it up into two and we looked specifically at two different regions. Each was led by um, the wonderful team at Tamil Archive Project, led by uh, this wonderful person here, uh, Vazuki, Dr. Vazuki Shanmugamathan, who uh, spearheaded the Tamil Archive Project. And this is just some images from uh, the tours that I wanted to share. Um, I was fortunate enough with Kyle actually to go on this tour. And um, we actually went to Knox United Church. We looked at some of the uh, historical farmland and then the corresponding ways in which they designed uh, some of the stained glass in the church. Um, we started the tour at Dragon Center Mall, which also has a very interesting history in Asian court as like the only Chinese owned and operated uh, mall malls in the region. Um, and then in the middle here, you can actually see uh, this mural, which was created uh, of the Asian court uh, neighborhood by uh, the mural artist Elixir Elliott. And you've probably seen uh, some of their uh, paintings and photos across, or painting, sorry, murals across the city of Toronto. And we also were lucky enough to have artist uh, Wandy Chang, who is just down here, uh, present to us uh, about her experience of creating art in pandemic and like what it means to be from the Asian court community as part of this tour. So we are uh, hoping to deliver these tours again uh, in the spring, so keep an eye out. And we also, as part of the, the Cultural Hotspot Project, got to work with Carrie McDonald at the City of Toronto to develop a uh, self-guided uh, automated tours on the Driftscape app. So you can actually go and take the agent court tour yourself if you wanted to and see some of the wonderful things around uh, the neighborhood. So that pretty much wraps up the presentation, but I just hope that uh, what you take away from this is an understanding of, you know, art installations, public art projects, like, you know, projects with participants, like ways in which you can engage and really work with the city of Toronto to get some of those like spark ideas out there in the community, because they really mean a lot and they really do a lot for our local, uh, economies, communities, and people. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Derek and Kyle for the wonderful and touching, very personal uh, presentation. So greatly appreciate that. I'm sure everybody um, on the video call uh, is feeling the same way. Uh, you're getting a lots of uh, feedback in, in, the, in the chat there as well too. And, and as Kyle had, had mentioned, the intersections uh, installation uh, is uh, officially launching this uh, Friday. Um, and it's at two locations, as uh, Kyle had mentioned. And if you want to know the specifics, so you, you can head down there starting this Friday and it'll run for two months. So it doesn't have to be like this Friday where you're dropping everything you're doing <laughs> for, for the day, but you've got two months to, to see it. Uh, both are on the eastbound platforms of the RT. One is for Scarborough Center, and then the other is at uh, Kennedy Station RT eastbound platform starting this Friday, running for two months. So I just wanted to plug that as well. Um, so now is a, a great time. If there's uh, anybody who has any questions for, for Derek or for Kyle on on uh, anything uh, related to their experiences with a cultural hotspot, be it as an applicant, be it as a trustee, be it as a, uh, a mentee, part of a program, floor is over. Derek and Kyle are here for you. Um, hi, it's Luann from Working Women Community Center. Um, 
Derek, I did have a question. If there are any small arts groups that, you know, um, approach us or mention that they're interested in accessing this funding or doing a project, should we then refer them to you for trusteeship? Is that something that has been happening? It's something that we could take on, but also other organizations that might be aligned. You know, Andrea Raymond Wong might have some, some insights on this as well, because the way that it's worked for us with Cultural Hotspot has typically been that the city has approached us to say, hey, we have this project and they're vetting it. But um, I would say like, you know, any organization that has the administrative capacity um, and, and probably has artistic expertise to do an intermediary agreement, is probably good, but for sure you can reach out to us. We would be happy to talk about like what that kind of partnership would look like. Um, but I'm just saying like the options are just really anybody that has that established charitable status. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and we're and we're definitely happy to to provide that role, like the cultural hotspot team, to kind of hear what the project is, what the needs of the particular partner might be, and and sometimes that sparks for us appropriate trustees that might really benefit the project and the person kind of seeking trusteeship. Great, thanks. Because a lot of times people will come to us because you know we're who they know, and sometimes we are the appropriate organization. But then sometimes there's some more you know, something specific that we think, hmm, you know, they might be better served. So I do appreciate that because it's, it's always good to have partners to refer out to. For sure. Yeah, and I would say, uh, Luann, if you, I also read your comment about uh, Vic Park and Eglinton, so the choice okay. side. Um, yeah. So if you want to, to connect with me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we yeah. could maybe even just chat about it if you had any further questions about the trust, the trustee sure. or the intermediate. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Luann, for the question. Derek's put uh, his email into the chat. So if it's all good with everybody, I'm gonna pass the, the mic over to Lori Diaz, who will give an orientation on the JAM board. Thanks so much, Paul. So I've put the link uh, to the Golden Mile JAM board in the chat, and we're gonna leave it up for approximately two weeks. Um, we're inviting everybody to please leave marks on the jam board and I've forgotten to share my screen one moment. There we go. So for those who have not participated in a jam board before welcome to our environment. Um, this is like a big drawing board that we can all participate in collectively. I'm going to add a marking on our golden mile jam board which focuses on the area between Lawrence um, Eglinton and then Sinclair to the south. Uh, so it's not all the neighborhoods we're including for the hotspot, but it's the focus area for our discussion. And I'm going to add one of my favorite local little art pieces, which on Crockford is Dino Park, right around here. And we're gonna fill it in red. It might be a bit big, but this is where I am putting Dino Park. Um, that's one of my favorite little places. I believe it's that, yes, there. If you don't, aren't familiar, I hope everyone can see this. Uh, it's these sculptures that are from a laser cutting company. So uh, we also invite you to add highlights. Let's say that you enjoy uh, and wanna see more art activations along like the hydro corridor or the meadow project area. Uh, I'm gonna put some highlighting around this area here. Please let us know and mark up the board. So I'm going to be here on the Jamboard while in the fall uh, leads the discussion questions. Is that cool in the fall? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I kind of uh, touched upon the, one of the, the questions is uh, what, uh, spaces within uh, the Golden Mile area. And, and this can also be like an Ion View, uh, clearly, clearly Birchmount, like Wexford. What areas in that Golden Mile area, what spaces uh, do you feel uh, are uh, like ripe for further activation or in need of activation? Um, so that's uh, the first question. So when you're doing the, the jam board, um, or even if you just want to like voice that, maybe one of us can can also tackle that as well too. So, what spaces in the Golden Mile area do you would you like to see 
some form of art or cultural activation? That's like the, the first question. And feel free to just like plop it out there in terms of like starting the con starting a conversation and jumping on board. Feel I know free that to jump into the chat too. And I know that Luann had uh, mentioned having the Scarborough sign <clears throat> come and have a, a residence, if you uh, want to use that word at uh, VP in Eglinton um, at a choice property. So that's also already a good start. So thank you in advance, uh, Luann, for, for, for sharing that. Are there any other places, spaces? I jump out at anybody? We have a squirrel adding a favorite local art piece just north of Eglinton off of Ion View. And I say squirrel because those are the chosen creatures for the Jamboard. Sorry, that's me. I'm just trying to put the put Luann's <laughs> idea of the Scarborough sign at the Thank station. you, Derek. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, nice. Derek, AKA the squirrel, <laughs> as you will henceforth be known. I'm just kidding. I mean, this is an opportunity and no pressure. If we have to move on to the next question, we will, but really to just kind of, you know, think out loud about maybe there's a wall that you imagine seeing animated with a mural. You know, there's an old swimming pool that you want to do a dance performance in while it is drained of water. There's a parking lot that, you know, you want to see an animation um, like what was done up with the Wexford Pops. You know, there's spaces that you can imagine things happening in. So th thank you, Kyle. Cineplex on Eglinton are across the street. Hmm, let's see. Oh, the Scarborough sign or signage around the tunnels in the Ashton B area. Mm. I mean, the, the area is, is also sometimes it's more like what's there in the, in the existing built environment. And I think I mentioned this in a call with uh, city planning that's focused on the Golden Mile area. One thing is that is not lacking is parking <laughs> within the Golden Mile area. There is a lot of uh, parking lots and parking spaces. Um, so thank you, Onika, for just kind of highlighting that, that maybe using that as a, as a resource for activation. You know, it, it doesn't have to be idyllic green space. Um, sometimes you just have to work with what you have. And there's a lot of concrete and there are a lot of parking lots. And, and Andrea, um, just even that as like an idea. Uh, yeah, parking lot, art animation, um, even just uh, talking about uh, project in North York at Jane Finch Mall uh, with an artist residency um, uh, that uh, also a, a cultural hotspot signature project. So even something like that might be possible. So Luann has a comment here in the chat, Crockford south of Eglinton, it would be cool to see more of that coppery looking signage maybe by the first student bus parking area. Okay, first student bus parking area. Or maybe at South Florence. I mean, something else that, that I mean, it's not up to me, I'm not making the art, but I mean, I've loved seeing kind of through the intersections project or the Scarborough Maid project that have happened this year, um, you know, using spaces like the library or like the subway and having vinyls and photographs shown large scale in public spaces. Um, I think that's been pretty cool. We do have, uh, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, forgive me, uh, Janani from uh, Toronto Public Library at uh, uh, joining us on the call today. And uh, so just as a, as a note that we do, we have reached, hey there, Janani. We have reached out to uh, TPL um, and let them know about the, the cultural hotspot and being in the Golden Mile area. I'm not sure if you want to say hello, even if it's a hello, Janani, to everybody. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the invite. Um, it's so lovely to meet all of you. Um, I'm 
actually the branch head from the Kennedy Eglinton Library. I'm just representing Eglinton Square Library because I know you guys are in the Golden Mile. Um, yes, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name uh, correct. Is it Nawal? Oh, Nafal. Nepal. But I'll, I'll take I'll take Nawal as well too. I don't want I'm to so start. I'm so I'll sorry. Um, Nepal, um, um, I know when we did the introduction, I know you told us about some of the told me about some of the um, projects that you guys did, did work on uh, with the library, and I think it's amazing. I know Cedar Bray got a new um, art installation at their branch. So yes, there has been a lot of uh, partnerships that have been going on with the Toronto Public Library. Um, I also wanted to suggest um, maybe like a mural art um, at the back of uh, the library plaza itself. There's just like, you know, empty spaces where artwork um, can be uh, installed. The thing is, um, INVU is a very um, thriving, um, resilient area. The thing is, um, our neighborhood is a neighborhood improvement area. So there's a lot of barrier, barriers. There's a lot of focus in that specific community. So it would be nice to see some, some sort of artwork there. Kennedy Eglinton in general, it is thriving with all the construction that's happening. So it'll always be nice to see something active um, going on. So that's something that I did want to share. Um, in terms of proof of vaccination with in-person programming right now, Toronto Public Library will, has has a mandate where um, in-person program is going to be starting. Um, but the thing is, we're not asking any proof of vaccination from uh, customers just because that does create a barrier. We're focused, our main focus with our strategic plan is on equity. So um, creating those barriers basically um, does not uh, go with our goals and objectives. Um, so because of that, uh, we are not asking for proof of vaccination. It's only staff because we are a city agency. Staff have to be um, vaccinated. But when, when it comes to the public, clients coming in, no. Um, maybe external partnerships, leaders that are going to conduct those programs, definitely. But um, general public, no way. That's not something that we're asking. So like I really like the live stream option or people that want to come in, um, they can. But um, Staff wise, okay, but when it comes to the public, it's just the barriers, yeah. And you don't want to do that, especially when you want to um, create an inclusive, um, diverse community. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, sorry, I'm going to keep interjecting not to take us off topic, but just to say, I did put a note in the chat, and many of you are doing this, but I know we didn't give you a chance to kind of formally introduce yourselves to each other. So just an opportunity to kind of introduce yourself in the chat, knowing that you can maybe then reach out to fellow artists and organizations who are attending the meeting um, based on what's in the chat there. So just throwing it over that way, because many of you are adding your info there. So thank you. Um, and Janani, I feel like we'll be in touch with you maybe about the library being a spot where we can maybe do some outreach creatively if that works. I'm um, definitely looking forward to that. That would be amazing for our awesome. area, especially with the lot going on in that specific community um, along the, the, with the whole LRT project. So yes, please. Yes. Okay. We're looking awesome. forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Maybe on that note, we get to like leave school early. <laughs> today that's always like a what like a highlight when when we were in school um is to to get out a bit early so the the bells uh hasn't rung officially yet but we're allowed to leave so uh just want to thank everybody uh for joining today um special uh, uh shout out to both uh derek and to kyle for for presenting uh to onika for uh coming in after teaching at Centennial College, I uh, get that right, and then leading our African uh, ancestral acknowledgement. Um, thanks to the entire Hotspot team. Uh, we look forward to working with you in the Golden Mile area.